Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and this is the first of a two-part series that I've had several requests for, and that is how to deal with images when your persistence layer is something like core data or realm. Images can be large, and putting all of your eggs in one basket, so to speak, is not a great idea, both from a performance point of view, and your database becomes really large very quickly. The prevailing recommendation is to store your images locally to your database directly, and just keep a reference to that image stored as a property in one of your database records. This works well for both Realm and Core Data, two offline persistence data sources that I use. In this tutorial, I'm going to be using Core Data, as it requires no third-party packages. I won't be getting into much detail in Core Data, except to say that things have evolved so much recently in Core Data that implementing a simple, single table or entity with no relationships is extremely easy. I won't skip any steps, but this is not a tutorial in Core Data. The focus is on the methodology for saving images to Documents directory with references to your database, regardless of your choice of your database solutions. I love getting your feedback, so tap the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe to the video and ring that bell to get notifications of new videos. And if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. There is a starter project for this series and you can download it from the link in the description. However, I've not really added anything to the project except for an app image, a launch screen, and I've changed the app entry point, the file where app main is located, to app entry as I do with all of my apps. I've also supplied some sample photos you may wish to use, as you will see later on. So here's what we're going to be building. It's a simple app that displays a grid of images that you can select from your Photos album. You can add new images, and you can provide a name for that image. Once added, that new entry is saved in Core Data, and the image is stored in the device's Documents directory with a link in Core Data, so it can be displayed in the next launch. It is displayed alphabetically in the grid once the view is dismissed. You can edit an existing image, and you can change the image, and you can change the name. When you do this, the image information gets updated in Core Data, and the updated image is replaced in the Documents directory. And finally, you can delete one of your images, and this will remove the references of the object from Core Data, and also delete the image from the Documents directory. That's it. I'm going to be following the methodology I learned from Mark Moikens, the author of several visual guides for SwiftUI, including the SwiftUI View Mastery and SwiftUI Animations Mastery, among others. He's currently working on a new book about core data that I had the privilege of working through in beta. Keep an eye out for it, as it's a game changer and completely changed my opinion of core data. So let's get started. First, let's create a folder group and call it core data. This will keep all of our core data related files in here. The first thing that we need to do is to create our data model. And for core data, we do that by creating a new file and search for the data model. I'm going to call mine my images data model. We'll have to remember exact spelling of this name. Your models in core data are called entities and you create a new one by adding a new entity by clicking on this button. And you will have to give your entity a name, and I'll call mine my image, and it represents a single object, and we're going to have two properties, and these properties are called attributes. I'm going to create one called ID that is of type string, and then another one that I'm going to be calling name that is also a string. I told you this is a simple database. That's it. By default, all string properties in Core Data are optional, so we'll have to deal with that shortly. Core Data serves as a wrapper around the underlying database, and the default database that is used when we create our data model is SQLite, but you don't need to know anything about SQL. The functions used by Core Data handle that for us. And this is done through a persistent container, and it's managed by an object's view context. 
This acts as a staging ground where current information is stored in memory and only persisted when we tell it to save. So we'll need a class that will be our persistence container. So we'll create a new file and call it my images container. Import core data and create a class called my images container. Next, create a stored property for persistent container that is of type NS persistent container. Well, this will need to be initialized so we can create an init for that where we can assign to the persistent container an instance of the NS persistent container and that requires the name of our data model. Remember I told you we needed to know the spelling of that and mine is my images data model. Within the initializer, we'll need to call the load persistent stores method for that persistent container. I have no need for the description, but if there is an error, we should probably find out what it is. So I'll print out the errors localized description. Well, that's it for the container. I did mention that string properties in core data are all created as optionals, and the actual model file is hidden from view and it contains some useful methods that we'll be using to update and fetch our records. But again, we don't need to see that. What I want to do, however, is to create two computed properties that will unwrap the optionals. And I can do that by creating an extension on the My Images model. So I'm going to create a new Swift file that I'm going to call My Image plus extension. Inside there, I'll create an extension for My Image. And I'll create a computed property called name view that is a string that will return the name property, but I'm going to use no coalescing so that if it is optional, I'll return an empty string instead. And I'm going to do a similar thing for the ID property, but I'll call this one image ID. Now to get access to the view context, which we get from our My Images Containers persistent container view context, Swift UI has an environment key path that we can use. At our app entry point then, we'll add an environment, and the key path is managed object context, and the value is the view context of the persistent container that we have in our My Images Container class. So let's get on with it then. First of all, let me refactor and rename the content view to better represent what's going to be in this. And it is going to be a grid of images, so I'll call it my images grid view. And I'll make sure I change the preview provider as well. Now that it's in the environment, we can use a fetch request property wrapper in our initial view to fetch all of the my image objects from our core data store and assign them to a variable that we can work with. This comes for free in SwiftUI and it creates a request to fetch all of the objects of a particular entity in our database. This is the fetch request property wrapper. At the time of fetching, we can also specify how we want the images to be sorted using a sort descriptor. And we want our images to be sorted based on the name that we provide, so we can use that as our key path. And what we'll get back is a set of fetched results. And since we didn't specify what our type was in our initializer, we can do it here. We are fetching objects that are of the type my image, and they're going to be assigned to the property called my images. This will currently be empty, but eventually we will have a number of images and names stored in the database and the corresponding images in our documents directory. So if the results are not empty, we'll want to display a grid of photos. But if it is, we'll want to display a text view telling our user to select the first image and provide them in both cases with a toolbar button to initiate the picking of a photo. So let's replace the body with a navigation stack. Within there, we'll create an if clause. So if not my image is empty, we'll just put a comment here that we'll replace later. 
Else, we'll present that text view specifying select your first image. We'll need to add a navigation title and a toolbar. And we can't attach that to a conditional clause, so we'll need to embed the clause in a group and add the navigation title to the group, and I'll use the string My Images. Before we can create our toolbar button to invoke the picking of a photo, we'll need to create a helper class that will assist us, and that's the new Photos UI. I have an entire video on this that goes into more detail, and I'll leave a link in the notes below. But we can build it quickly here now. Create a new file called Image Picker and import both Swift UI and Photos UI. Create a class called Image Picker that will conform to the Observable Object Protocol and it'll be responsible for updating the UI to display photos, so it needs to operate on the main queue. So decorate it with the at main actor attribute. I'll need three optional properties. One will be for the Photos Picker item that will be retrieved via the Photo Picker's View button that we're going to have, and it will be an optional Photos Picker item. We'll need one that will be assigned to the image view that we'll want to update in our view, and we'll make that one optional as well. And the third will be the actual UI image that we'll be saving to our Documents folder and once more, it's optional. So when you select the photo from your Photos album, it provides this Photos Picker item, which conforms to the transferable protocol. And we'll need to try and transfer that image data into an actual image. So we'll create a function that we'll call load transferable, and we'll use that image selection which is that optional Photos Picker item, and it's an asynchronous operation that may throw an error. So we'll create a do catch block and try and await the load transferable method from the image selection where the type is data.self. Now the data is optional, however, and so we'll use an if let to make sure that it is not and then check to see if we can form a UI image from the data using another iflet. If so, then we can assign that UI image to our published property version and create an image using that UI image. Now, if that try operation fails, we can catch and print the error's localized description. The last step here is to be able to call this method. And this gets called each time we update the image selection published property. So I'm going to create a did set property observer on this property. Then, since the function we want to call is asynchronous, we'll create a task unit of work and then try and await the results of the load transferable method from this image selection. We can now then create our toolbar button on our My Image view. So I'll create a State Object Image Picker property that's an instance of our new observable object. To add a toolbar to our view now, I'll create a toolbar modifier below the navigation title. But if I'm going to create a Photos Picker, I'll need to import Photos UI. Within the toolbar, I'll create a toolbar item where the placement is navigation bar trailing. And then the item itself will be an instance of the Photos Picker view. The title key, which is the label, will just be New Image. The selection will be the image selection from our image picker. The matching will be on images as we only want to select photos. And the photo library that we want to access will be our shared photos library. Well, this acts just like a button, just as navigation links do. 
so we can apply a button style. So let's use bordered prominent. We can test this now in the preview. So when tapped, the photos picker appears and allows us to select a photo. So what's next? Well, once selected, we'll need to present a form that will display the image and allow the users to enter a name for the image. When they fill in the information and click on save, we'll need to create a My Image object and save it in Core Data. And this will require that we create a unique ID for each of our new images. And then we'll use that ID to create a name for the image and then compress it slightly and save it to the Documents directory. To manage the creation and updating of items, I'm going to use a technique that I've used often in my videos to present a form that I can use for both the creation of the new objects and the editing of those objects. When I create my new image, I want to present a form using the selected image so that I can display the image and allow me to enter a name before creating that new object. If I'm updating, I want to pass into that form the entire existing My Image object which contains the name and the ID of that object where the image is stored in the documents directory. So we're going to have to have three different things here to be able to manage this. First, we'll create a form view model, and then a form. Then we're going to create an enum that we can use as an identifiable object to present the form when an image has either been selected or tapped on to update. I detail all of this in this video here, so I'll leave a link in the description below. So let's get started. Create a new group folder called Form. Inside there, we'll create our Form View Model file first. We're going to be dealing with images, so I'm going to change the import to UI Kit. I'll create a class of the same name and I'll have it conform to the observable object protocol. I'm going to need two published properties as described. One for the name that will instantiate with an empty string, and this will be used for our text field. The other for the UI image that will be of type UI image, that will either be the selected image if we're creating a new one, or it could be an existing image if we're updating. And I want the view model to cover both cases, so we can't assign anything to it here because we won't know. We'll get an error because we've not yet initialized the UI image property, but we'll need to get to that. First, create an ID property that's an optional string. When we're creating a new object, we'll not yet know or have an ID, but when we're updating, we do have one. So that's why it's optional. It'll be really handy to know if we are updating so that we can modify our form accordingly. So we'll create a computed property called updating that's a Boolean based on whether or not the ID is not nil. Now we can create our initializer, and in fact, we'll need two of them. One, if we're creating a new my image, where we'll pass in the UI image received from the photos picker, and the second, when we'll pass in the full existing My Image object. So in the first case, then, we'll assign to self's UI image the UI image that we get when we initialize. And then in the second case, where we're updating, we have that full My Image, so we can assign to the name the My Image name view. And then for the ID, we're going to assign the image ID. The problem we have for now is how do we get that UI image from our documents directory to display in the image view on the form that we'll be creating? We've not yet talked about all of that. So for now, let's just use a placeholder image. And we'll come back to that and edit this later. So we'll use a UI image with the system name photo. And I know that exists, so we can safely unwrap it. Now the final thing we'll need to do is to not allow any saving or updating of our name field if it's empty, or if our UI image is that placeholder image. So we'll create a computed property here that we can use. Next then we can stub out our form view. 
Again, in the Forms folder, create a new file and call it Image Form View. Create an observed object that will be passed into the view when it's presented, and it will be an instance of our Form View model. So we'll call it View Model, and it will be that Form View Model type. As this view will be presented as a sheet, we can use the environment key value dismiss to set up a dismiss property that we can call as a function to dismiss the view. To stop the preview from complaining, we can pass in an instance of the form view model using the initializer that passes in any UI image. And again, we can just use our placeholder image. Probably should have created a constant for this, but I didn't. Now we can lay out our form. Replace the body with a navigation stack because we'll want our modal view to have a title and some navigation bar buttons. And inside there, create a V stack. Inside the V stack, we'll display an image using the UI image provided by our view model, which you will see in the preview is that SF symbol. We'll make it resizable and scale to fit. It's blurry, but we'll never see it in the app. It's just here so that we can see what our view layout will look like. Below that, create a text field with the string image name and the text bound to the view model's name property. Let's add a spacer and some padding to the V stack. Now before the spacer, add an H stack that's going to contain two buttons, and we'll complete most of the actions in the next video. The first view will be a button to allow us to update the image, but it will only be available if we're updating, so we can use the view model's updating property to check that. Well, that button is actually an image picker, so we'll need to both import Photos UI and get another instance of our image picker state object so that we can grab that image picker button. So that photos picker view as before that I've called the button, we can create similarly. The label is going to be change name. The selection this time will be bound to the image picker's image selection property. We'll match again only images in our shared photos library. We'll set the button style this time to just be bordered. Now you won't see any updates in the preview because our initializer is for the new image and we're conditionally only allowing this if it's for an update. The second item in the H stack will be a button that will save our core data object and save the image to the documents directory. So for the action right now, I'm just going to dismiss the view, but for the label, I'll use a system image of a check mark. And then I'll set the button style to bordered prominent, but set the tint to green. But I'll also disable it if the view model's incomplete property is true. And it is incomplete because our text field is bound to our view model's name property and it's empty. Next, we'll add a navigation title to our VStack that is conditional depending on whether we are creating a new image or updating an existing one. We will say update image if we're updating, otherwise, new image. And then we can set our navigation bar title display mode to inline. Now we can attach a toolbar to the view so that we can have a cancel and a delete button on our toolbar. So first we'll create a toolbar item with the placement being navigation bar leading. I'll create a simple button with the label cancel. And for the action, I'll just call the dismiss function. And I'll set the button style to bordered. The second toolbar item will only be visible if we're updating, so we'll create that condition. Then we can create a second toolbar item with the placement navigation bar trailing. We'll create a button 
with the action and for the label I want my system image to be a trash and I'll set the button style to be border prominent and I'll set the tint to red. I'll complete the action later. Again we don't see this showing up in our preview because of the initializer but we'll see it in the next lesson. Now there's one last thing we need to do here before we call it a day. When we present the Photos Picker by clicking on our button, we'll need to update the image here on this form. And when the image is selected, the image view is updated with the Image Picker's image property. But we'll need to assign the UI image to our form's view model UI image property so it can be saved to the Documents directory. So we can watch for changes on this Image Picker's UI image property with an onChange method. When that change happens, we'll get a new value that I can call new image, and we can assign that to the view model's UI image property. But it'll be optional, so we'll unwrap it using an iflet before we assign it to the view model's UI image property. So tune in next time where we'll create an enum to allow us to present this form view, and then we'll code our actions that will allow us to create, update, and delete our my image entries and images and then we'll create a nice grid view on our main screen to present all of our images and allow us to create updates and new ones.